All right, it looks like everyone is back, I think. Um, so a couple of quick things before we continue. Um, a number of you had questions on that final study that I talked about. Um, after hearing some of the questions, uh, I realized that I don't think I explained this as well as I could have. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. I, for, I cut out one slide. You probably noticed you had a slide in there that had uh, some predictions and hypotheses for two experiments. Uh, with both gains, non-gains, prevention and promotion, and fit and non-fit. Um, so I only presented one experiment and not two, uh, but kind of ended up collapsing across the two experiments to highlight the fit conditions. Um, what I want to do is, rather than go back to this right now, uh, let me just briefly tell you the change that I'm going to make, and then I'm going to update the slides there's no questions on this study on the quiz today, so there's no need about that, but I'll make sure that this is updated uh, in the slides, and then I'll talk about this again at the beginning of next week uh, so that I can go through this study uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, the slides, I'll put some additional context in the slides so that even if you don't, um, even if we, you know, even if you miss me going through it uh, tomorrow or next week, rather, uh, I'll have a chance to relabel these. Um, one of the things I didn't label is which one of these category sets uh, is the A panel and the D panel. Uh, so the one on the left, A, is the rule-based uh, category structure that has that two-dimensional boundary. The one on the right is the non-rule-based category set. And both of these uh, sets of data were taken from gains version of the task, not from loss versions of the task. So let me revise that a little bit. Um, I'll make some updates on the slides with some additional text so that you can sort of read what those changes are. Um, and then I'll spend maybe the next five minutes, the first five minutes of next week's class, just going through it again uh, to make sure it's clear in everyone's uh, mind. There might be some questions on the quiz about regulatory fit in general. So it might be a multiple choice question that asks something about uh, being in a state of regulatory fit or promotion focus or prevention focus and just as a definitional account. But I'm not asking about this particular study. So I think I can do a better job of explaining the study with a little bit more explanatory text on the slide. Um, and I'll try to make those changes uh, so that it's a little bit more clear next week. Does that seem okay? Because I don't want to run out of time for what's next. And I think that this will be Benef it'll benefit if I put more text on the slide. So give me a week to make those updates uh, and then we'll come back to things. But let's go back and talk about mood effects on cognition. But first I have to hide my floating meeting controls. Then apparently I need to show them again. And I guess I need to reload. You know, there was a time when this worked really well. I might have to go to the older technology of using like the little USB drive and then just plugging it directly into the computer. This was working fine because I didn't have to bring anything and I don't want to have to bring my laptop uh, to class. It's a lot easier just to run off of this, but apparently they're throwing roadblocks in the way here. So let's try this again. All right, I've refreshed that. Mode effects. All right, it better stay there because Okay, so um, let's discuss uh, positive and negative mode. I had this slide at the beginning uh, of the lecture. Um, and the suggestion is that your positive mood or a negative mood can affect the way you think about things. Uh, obviously, we've got to have ways to think about things when we're uh, in both kinds of moods, right? Uh, we experience all sorts of moods throughout the day, anxiety, frustration, uh, elation, joy, uh, irritation, uh, positive moods and negative moods, right? And we're thinking about things regardless of what kind of mood state we're in. Uh, but sometimes uh, it's clear that being in a good mood affects the way in which you approach tasks. It affects the way in which you approach the world. And being in a bad mood 
whether it's a sad mood or an angry or an irritated mood, also affects the way in which you approach tasks and affects the way in which you approach the world. Um, negative mood, there's lots of different ways to discuss it. So I'll talk about a few different ways uh, to induce negative moods, um, but sadness and anger are the two that are the most common uh, for us. Uh, and they're really a difference of a big difference of arousal. Uh, a sad mood is a negative mood that's a low arousal. Angry is a negative mood that's higher arousal. Uh, one motivates you to do things. Uh, the other one motivates you not to do things. Um, sadness uh, tends to reduce motiv uh, motivation. Uh, it can also uh, narrow attentional focus. Uh, you might focus on uh, fewer features if you're trying to pay attention to something, or you might focus on fewer attributes of something, uh, or you might not shift your focus. One of the things we'll see with negative mood uh, is that people tend to be less flexible. Uh, there's just a lower motivation overall if you're motivated uh, to solve a problem and you're in a bad mood, you're just less likely to change your approach. An angry mood, though, might narrow your attentional focus for different reasons, uh, possibly to determine what's making you angry, right? Uh, if you're in a really angry mood and you're presented with things that are making you angry, you want to figure out what it is. Uh, it can be a really helpful uh, cue. Uh, sometimes it can be good to be angry at something uh, because it lets you know that something is uh, not helpful or not good uh, or not is gonna, it's not going to be beneficial for you. Anger can help you eliminate those things that are making you angry by drawing your attention to them. Positive moods, so I mean, positive moods and negative moods are both important. They both have important functions. They can both be used uh, effectively if you're aware of what these moods uh, do to your cognitive processing. A positive mood can generally increase cognitive flexibility. Uh, whether or not it changes motivation is a different issue, but most people tend to feel more motivated uh, when they're in a positive mood. Uh, how many of you like to be in a positive mood when you're starting out in the beginning of the day, right? Uh, maybe you do something to boost your mood. Uh, there's lots of ways in which people suggest mood boosters, uh, ways to put yourself in a positive mindset or a positive mood so that you can be a little bit more exploratory and have greater cognitive flexibility. Not always possible. Angry negative moods are also useful because they help you isolate things that are causing dissatisfactory outcomes. So when I talk about the benefits of a positive mood, I don't necessarily mean that positive moods are always good. Uh, negative moods can be uh, effective uh, as well. I often get in a negative mood when this thing doesn't work. So one of the ways in which uh, I'm gonna talk about changing people's mood, both positively and negatively, involves what's known as a mood induction procedure. Um, this induces a temporary change in most people's mood. Uh, because mood and affect are things that are kind of complicated, right? I mean, it, your mood changes uh, based on certain biological things. Uh, how many of you get into a less good mood when you're hungry, right? They call it hangry. Uh, so being hangry uh, is one way to be in sort of an irritated negative mood. Uh, you might be in a positive mood when you're not hangry anymore, right? After a nice, big, satisfactory meal, maybe you're in a nice, uh, positive, mellow state. Listening to a certain kind of music might put you in a good mood. But also dealing with real-world frustrations, whether it's driving somewhere or weather that doesn't change uh, or things outside of your control, people behaving in ways that affects uh, your mood. So mood is something that's internal but externally uh, as an external locus. If we want to study it, though, we tend to rely on, we want to have some control over it. Uh, so we often rely on inducing a temporary mood state by trying to figure out ways to change people's affect, at least in the short term. And some of the common ways to do it um, are to uh, show people a short video that is emotionally inducing. Um, the video of the kids with the marshmallow effect, most people kind of it's kind of positive mood, right? You sort of enjoy seeing the kids uh, finally get their reward at the end, right? Uh, or just being sort of uh, kind of funny. Um, puts you in a good mood. Uh, there are lots of short videos which could also put you in a bad mood, uh, whether it's somebody 
um, you know, being unfairly targeted. Uh, one of the things that's really common uh, in inducing a negative mood is seeing someone who's uh, targeted unfairly uh, or accused unfairly or being given, uh, you know, sort of treated in a way that's unfair. Unfairness is something that we don't react well to. Um, if you're another way to induce a positive or negative mood is to ask you to think about something or to remember a time when you uh, did something that made you feel really proud, right? There's probably things that you did uh, in the last two years, let's say, uh, that you achieved, something that you were really successful in doing. Or you could be asked to remember some time when you experienced a painful loss uh, or some time when you disappointed someone. Uh, or you were disappointed in yourself. And that, if you reflect on that for a while and then are asked to write a story about that time when you did something that you were proud of or did something you were ashamed of, uh, it could start to put you in a negative mood. So that would be a story-based task. Uh, sometimes they are combined. You might listen to some upbeat, positive music and then watch a upbeat, positive video, which would put you in a positive mood. Or you might listen to some negative music and then write a story about a time you disappointed someone and then listen to some more downbeat music and eventually you'll be in a, a depressed uh, downbeat state. So they can induce positive or negative moods, but they don't always last very long. And so when we're gonna study their effects in cognition, we're gonna study their effects on cognition uh, or attention in relatively short periods of time. Um, for example, uh, here is one of a, here's a classic mood induction procedure to induce a negative mood. You are about to listen to a not particularly happy piece of music. It is meant to create a temporary sad mood. We would also like you to recall a sad event or a memory from in your life and then think about it while you listen to the music. Music can be a very personal thing and it may affect people differently. To help create a sad mood, however, try to think about or notice the sadness in the music and think about a sad event or memory. Tape, this was so old that they listened to a cassette tape. Tape takes about 10 minutes to complete. And so we get some sad music. Ah, this is actually not sad music. This is an annoying ad, so. Remind me to um, remind me to log in to my YouTube Premium account the next time, so we don't get these ads. Uh, so this particular piece um, from Prokofiev's uh, "Russia Under the Mongolian Yoke" was also played at half time, uh, so that it was particularly slow and uh, morbid sounding. So participant, we're not going to listen to the whole thing. Participants listen to this at half speed and then think about the saddest thing that ever happened to them. And it goes on like this for a while. And you're listening to it at half time. alone by yourself with your negative thoughts. You might be thinking about, you know, whatever it is that's putting you in a, so let's not do it for too long because we'll all be in a bad mood. Um, so that's negative mood induction. Um, problem is uh, it doesn't necessarily, by the way, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, leave this without trying to make it full screen because you know what's gonna happen it's going to forget. Is it okay if I just do this for now? Because I don't feel it, because I'm going to have to go to another video. After I go to the other video, then I'll go back to full screen. So in, in a fairly recent study, uh, people look, so the psychologists looked at how long these mood induction procedures last for a negative mood. So if I'd kept that going for 10 minutes at half speed, and didn't say anything or make little, you know, sort of offhanded jokes about stuff. And you just thought about something really sad. Either you disappointed someone, a death, or maybe a death that's upcoming or something like that, or failure, whatever it is, the sad event. While this music is playing, you would be in kind of a sad mood for a little while. And then if we asked you 
you know, on a scale of one to something, how sad are you? And we had a, a measure, uh, which in this case is called the visual analog scale, which is basically a, a simple rating that's like a thermometer type rating to say like, what's your positive or negative mood? you would be in a negative mood. I mean, it's pretty obvious that after being told to be in a negative mood and being uh, listening to sad music and thinking about a sad event, you would be in a sad mood. Um, and that would last for about five minutes uh, at best. Uh, so the sad music and memory condition and the sad memory condition uh, generally induces a sad mood. Um, the music doesn't add very much. It seems to mostly be driven by the memory. Uh, but the music alone, uh, the sad music alone, has a slightly uh, elevated negative mood uh, component. So just listening to the sad music without being told to be sad about it kind of makes you a little bit glum. But mostly it's the memory doing it. Uh, asking people to think about when they disappointed their parents, for example, uh, is a really good example of a negative mood. Or asking people to think about a family death or a loved one or something. So the music seems to do something. Uh, neutral music doesn't seem to do very much at all. So you can really see there's a reliable boost. Um, people get sadder after thinking about sad events, reinforced with some sad music. It doesn't last very long uh, because we have protective measures against that. Uh, if you're being asked to think about a sad memory, uh, eventually you realize it's just a sad memory and there's lots of other things and you've got other stuff to think about uh, and your sad mode goes away. One of the things you'll see on the next experiment is that sad moods don't last very long experimentally, but positive moods last a little bit longer. Uh, they do tend to last a little longer. When you're in a positive mood, it's self-sustaining. It feels good to be in a positive mood. And so that keeps you in a positive mood. Uh, and so it lasts a little bit longer. We don't tend to sustain uh, sad moods as easily. Um, when being asked, so what happens in that five minutes uh, when you're being asked uh, to stay in a sad mood? Well, one thing that happens uh, is you tend to focus your attention differently. Uh, here's a very simple visual attention task, which is has no right answer, but you're asked to choose which one of these two options is the best match for the target. And you'll notice there are two ways to make the decision. The target is a triangle of triangles. So it has local features, little triangles, arranged in a global feature, a holistic triangle configuration. So there are features, triangle features, and there's triangle configuration. One of these uh, would be pre preferred if you were focusing on small details. One of them would be preferred if you were focusing on the big picture. Um, and so you then can choose whether or not you like the local feature uh, or you like uh, the global match. So what is the better match here? A square of triangles or a triangle of squares? What matters more, the configuration or the individual features? And what they found after asking people uh, to be in a negative mood uh, is that the negative mood participants were more likely to choose the local match. Uh, they were focusing a little bit more on details. So I said that negative mood often focuses your attention. It reduces your motivation, uh, but it also focuses your attention. So you're looking at details. I mean, you were just being asked to think about uh, negative details in your life, and now you're uh, asked uh, to make a, um, make a distinction based on whether or not it's details or big picture. Temporarily, you're losing the ability to see the big picture. Uh, so our negative mood subjects, people who are put in that negative mood instead of a happy mood, uh, are more likely to make this local match. There are lots of other studies which have shown kind of the same thing, that there's a local attention rather than a global big picture attention. But this is a very straightforward attention task. Uh, but it does suggest that these kind of temporary mood states can affect the things that we pay attention to. If you have a sustained negative mood, uh, it suggests that you might miss some of those contextual factors. You might miss paying attention to other features which could help you solve problems or make decisions or reason about things more effectively. So if you're making decisions that are suboptimal because you're in a sustained sad mood, that could be one reason why cognitively. Probably not the only reason why, but it could be one reason why. 
Well, what about positive mood induction? So we can induce a positive mood uh, in participants. Um, this is one that one of my grad students did about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, Ruby Nadler, who's the postdoc and now works uh, at, a, um, at, at a company uh, in London, uh, she, was one of my, she was a grad student in my lab about 10 years ago, and she was interested in categorization and category learning and cognitive flexibility and its relationship to positive and negative mood. Um, we were exploring the idea of being in a positive mood and how it might increase cognitive flexibility. Um, so one of the things we did was we chose a mood induction procedure um, rather than asking people to think about positive uh, memories, uh, we just asked them to do sort of a movie clip and video version, or sort of a movie clip uh, and a music version. So uh, we asked people to rate a series of different uh, songs and videos based on how positive or negative they were. Um, and here we have, uh, you can see positive mu music, um, some upbeat classical music uh, pieces, uh, which all sound should sound familiar. Um, neutral music is slow moving, or, but not necessarily uh, slow like the one we listen to. It's kind of mid-tempo uh, today. This was done a long time ago, but today this might be like, um, you know, that's sort of lo-fi music that uh, you might study to or something like that. It's not good or bad. It's just kind of chill music. Uh, negative music might be really slow, uh, negative sounding things, like in this case, the soundtrack to Schindler's List. Uh, we had some positive videos, some neutral videos, like uh, Antiques Roadshow, uh, where people are talking about antiques on public television. It's interesting, but it's not necessarily positive or negative, uh, or things about people dying uh, and so on. So they were either positive or negative videos. But mostly, well, we were interested in all three, but positive mood was what we were most interested in. So for example, um, upbeat sounding music, right? No. I'll sign in next time. So I'm already in a good mood, right? Lovely. Uh, and then this guy. This is the actual video we used. Oh, he's laughing at me. I mean, he was kind of hysterical in this case. And this was long before uh, Reels and TikTok uh, and um, viral videos. So this was 10 years ago. We didn't have much to choose from. Uh, so we found a video of a laughing baby uh, and some basic uh, music. But combined together, that seemed to put people in a pretty good mood. After listening to a few minutes of Mozart, and watching one minute of a baby laughing hysterically, people were reliably in a good mood and they rated themselves as being in a good mood. After listening to Schindler's List uh, and watching a video uh, of an earthquake uh, and just you know, seeing sort of the death and destruction, they were in a negative mood and they listed themselves as being in a less good mood. But then we wondered what their cognitive performance would be like. So we asked them to learn to classify objects into two categories. So in the um, regulatory fit condition uh, that we talked about in the previous uh, class or pre previous uh, half of today's lecture, uh, they were lines that were a different length and orientation. Same idea here, except what we had were uh, these crystal balls, a uh, crystal ball that had a pattern. The pattern had uh, alternating light and dark bands that could tilt in different directions, depending on which object you were seeing. And also the width of those light and dark bands could also vary. So two dimensions that you could pay attention to. And you had to choose, did it go to the blue wizard or the green wizard? And then you got some feedback when you made the condition. Uh, so pretty straightforward. And you just see a series of these until you learn what the blue wizard's crystal balls look like. 
and what the patterns on the green wizard crystal balls look like. Um, we also defined a boundary between the set of these crystal balls uh, that could either be described verbally, like a rule, or could not be described verbally, like a, non, like a linear boundary. Um, in this case, uh, there were two dimensions you had to pay attention to. The orientation dimension, which is the tilt, uh, was irrelevant. So people noticed it, and you can see there's a lot of difference there. Each one of these little dots, by the way, uh, represents a specific crystal ball in this two-dimensional space. These are some examples of the crystal balls and what they would look like in that region. Does that make sense? So you get 80 different stimuli. Um, so things either tilt to the right or they tilt to the left. But paying attention to orientation with a tilt does not let you know what category the crystal ball belongs in. The only thing that you can use to pay attention to make the decision correctly is the uh, frequency of the light and dark bands. Uh, that's a much harder uh, thing to pay attention to. So you can see these are slightly thicker, lower spatial frequency than these uh, light and dark bands are. So it's a more subtle feature. It's harder to notice, and it's not the one that you would likely notice first. So what that means is you have to test a hypothesis. What our subjects do in a case like this is they start paying attention to orientation, and they quickly realize that orientation doesn't make any difference. It's not correlated to the correct response. That takes a few you know, 10, 20 trials to figure that out. Uh, you're making these responses, uh, but that doesn't seem to be giving you reliable information. Something else must be there. So you have to switch your attention, and then you have to engage in some inhibitory control to ignore orientation and focus on frequency until you can find a rule that you can describe verbally, which is uh, things that are thicker lines belong in one category, thinner lines belong in the other category. So it's a rule, people have to test hypotheses. Cognitive flexibility will help in this case because it lets you explore more rules and it gives you more capacity to inhibit the attention to the dimension that's not relevant. Does that seem straightforward? In this case, uh, they still saw stimuli uh, that varied in terms of tilt and spatial frequency, uh, but there was not a one-to-one -one match with one of those features. Um, furthermore, it's difficult to describe the rule verbally. There's definitely a rule, there's definitely a boundary, but it's one that people seem to learn gradually. Um, if you test the hypothesis that there's an orientation rule, uh, you're gonna get chance performance. It's not the right rule. If you then switch and go with a frequency rule, uh, you're going to get chance performance. It's not the right rule. So people, if they're increased cognitive flexibility, uh, won't necessarily benefit with early performance because they might switch and keep trying to find a rule that doesn't exist. Uh, rather, uh, you would be able to learn this category set by gradually learning to associate things that look alike uh, with one response and things that look alike uh, with another response. So you can learn it, but it doesn't necessarily benefit from exploration and hypothesis testing. We suspected that positive mood, we were hypothesizing it would increase cognitive flexibility, would allow better performance here, uh, but not better performance here. Um, and mostly that's what we found. So for this rule described RD, rule described category set, uh, when they were in the positive mood after listening to Mozart and watching The Laughing Baby, uh, they started off performing better uh, and maintain that advantage over the neutral mood and the negative mood. So once they were in a good mood, they stayed in a good mood because of course now they're getting more correct answers. Uh, so that's positive mood is kind of self-sustaining in this case. Um, and when they were in a negative mood, they started off performing less well, but only for the first 80 trials. So this block here, this block number one shows the average over the first 80 trials. Remember, so there were 80 individual stimuli they learned to classify. So you see all 80 of them in a random order, then you see more in a random order, more in a random order, and so on. Uh, so performance was worse for this first block for people in the negative mode. But quickly, of course, they're still getting correct answers. So the negative mood doesn't sustain uh, because they're learning the category set, they're getting positive feedback, uh, they've forgotten the sad music and the sad video. Now they're kind of focused on the task itself. And sure, they're not performing as well as the people who saw The Laughing Baby, uh, but they are performing reasonably well and they catch up with the neutral mood people. That's kind of your average baseline. 
So they get a little bit of a deficit at the beginning, but once they get the hang of it, they've forgotten their negative mode, and now they perform just as well as the neutral mode can, uh, subjects. Positive mode people, though, they stay ahead. Uh, they're definitely performing better. Um, and they don't see this advantage uh, for that information integration, non-rule-based category structure. So for the structure that doesn't benefit from cognitive flexibility, uh, everybody performs roughly the same. There's no detriment to being in a negative mood, but there's no enhancement to being in a positive mood. Uh, participants are learning through stimulus response association. Uh, cognitive flexibility doesn't hurt, and so we don't see the positive mood uh, advantage. Does that seem clear? Great. Um, let's talk about one final example here, and this has to do with cognitive control. Um, cognitive control related to this idea of self-control. Uh, so the same thing that was sort of underlying the marshmallow effect uh, seems to be a limited resource. In the example that I started off class today with, which was either driving in a snowstorm uh, or driving with people fighting, uh, children fighting behind you, any of those things where there's a competition for your attention requires some ability to inhibit, to not pay attention. You don't want to pay attention to the fighting behind you because you need to focus on driving. Uh, if you are, depending on where you live in town, uh, and you're trying to finish your thesis on Friday, and there's St. Patrick's Day stuff starting over across the street, you probably need to inhibit paying attention, right? Because uh, you're still trying to focus on your ta the task at hand. You need to not pay attention to what's out there. And the longer it goes, uh, the more cognitive resources it's going to uh, take. Um, so this idea, uh, that the active self or the self that lets you self-regulate as a limited resource has been termed ego depletion. We can also call it resource depletion or cognitive depletion. Um, and so a lot of studies that were done in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, uh, hundreds of different studies that were done in social and cognitive psychology, uh, looked at this idea. Uh, that performing some kind of act of self-regulation, whether it's avoiding a marshmallow uh, or whatever else, uh, and will affect performance on a subsequent executive function task, suggesting that the two types of tasks share resources. Um, so for example, in Baumeister's early study, when subjects forced themselves to eat radishes instead of chocolates, they were given two things that they could possibly eat. The chocolate was there, they could smell it and see it, but they had to eat radishes instead. Uh, when they were doing that, avoiding something that they liked and doing something they didn't, um, they then displayed reduced persistence on puzzle solving tasks. So engaging in some kind of self-regulation, not eating the marshmallow, meant that later on when you had to do something else that also required persistence, even though it was really different, like a puzzle solving task, meant that you didn't stick with it as long because you had already wasted your cognitive depletion. Uh, you had sort of wasted your resources. Ego depleted individuals rely more heavily on heuristics. So system one, more likely to use. Um, participants who have to regulate their emotions. That's the, I'm not gonna yell at the kids behind me uh, task. Uh, or I'm not gonna cry when I see this sad movie uh, is regulating your emotions, uh, or I'm not gonna laugh at a funeral because something funny, has that ever happened to anybody? Uh, where you start laughing at a time when you're not supposed to laugh because something sad has happened. And it's really hard to not laugh when other people start, once you get that in your mind that you're not supposed to laugh and someone else is over there laughing at the same thing and it's really inappropriate, it's really hard to not laugh. It takes a lot of cognitive effort um, they then performed more poorly on subsequent tasks of working memory. Um, and there have been some suggestions that it takes, uh, takes enough, uh, metabolizes uh, enough that you can measure differences. So trying to inhibit some kind of attention or regulate your emotions requires a little bit more energy uh, than not uh, inhibiting your emotions. Um, one of my... Uh, uh, grad students at roughly the same time, is about the same time that we were doing the mood induction study, one of my other uh, grad students was interested uh, in this idea of cognitive resource depletion. Uh, and we used the same kind of task, this category learning task that subjects can either learn with a rule or not learn with a rule. 
Um, and what Rachel did uh, in this case is we asked our subjects to engage in either an ego depletion task, which would require a little bit more cognitive control, a little bit more executive function and working memory, or not. And then we would ask them to learn either the rule-defined category structure, the one for which cognitive control and inhibition is important, or the other category structure for which there is no benefit to having uh, additional uh, cognitive resources available. So in this ego depletion experiment, uh, subjects were given 10 minutes to write a story. We gave them a prompt. I said, write a story about something that happened to you, but do not use the letter A or M. <clears throat> so if you use a word that has A or M in it, <clears throat> Think of another word, uh, scratch that word out, uh, come up with a different word. So you've got to do two things here. What makes this difficult is that you're writing a story, but as you're writing the story, you're monitoring your word usage. You have to then use vigilance to look for the letters A and M, and then you have to use some additional cognitive resources to search for words that don't have A and M. Uh, so it's going to take you longer to write this story. It's going to take more effort to write the story because you're using cognitive effort effort uh, to do both of these things simultaneously. It's kind of a short story because uh, they don't get very far, um, but it takes them a long time uh, to get there, right? So you can imagine doing this. Those are common letters. Uh, if you can't use A or N, you've got to come up with other words that don't have A or N in them. So it makes you do two extra things, vigilance and also searching your lexicon. Compared to the control condition, who had 10 minutes to write the same story, but they weren't given any kind of uh, distraction or restrictions. They didn't have to worry about what letters to use. So this should require more cognitive control than this task. Uh, if there's an inhibition, uh, con if there's a delay or if it taxes their inhibitory control, uh, then any kind of subsequent task, a category learning task like this one, we use the same category structure, uh, this one that requires uh, hypothesis testing, rule selection, and so on, should be worse after doing the story writing task. So the tasks are different on the surface, but the idea is they tap into the same cognitive resource of um, cognitive control, self-control, uh, inhibitory control, and so on. And that's what we found. Uh, so for this non-rule-defined category set, uh, the one with the sort of angled boundary. There's no difference between the two conditions again. Um, but for the category structure that requires more attention, hypothesis testing, greater uh, reliance on working memory capacity, uh, we saw a reduction for the participants who were learning under these ego depletion conditions. Uh, they lagged behind, whereas the control participants did not. Uh, so in the first study, a positive mood increased performance. Uh, on this task. But in this study, uh, doing two things uh, prior uh, reduced performance uh, on the same task. So to summarize, the positive mood seemed to improve performance. Um, and it turns out that positive mood can sometimes even uh, eliminate some of the ego depletion effect. So doing something that makes you exhausted, taking a short break, and then putting yourself in a positive mood can help. Uh, reduce some of that uh, cost. You've probably figured some of this out through trial and error, right? Uh, when you're exhausted, you take a break. Uh, and what do you do when you take a break? You do something that puts you in a good mood. Um, that's probably one of the reasons why a lot of us know that things that are related to a smartphone can be a distraction, right? Because that's the most immediately available positive mood uh, booster, right? You want to see uh, what comes next uh, when you swipe up to the next video? Uh, is it going to be something entertaining? Uh, is it going to be something that's going to keep you uh, looking at the next video? So it's good for TikTok, right, to keep you on the platform. Uh, it's good for Instagram to keep you on the platform. And it's good for you for a little while uh, to put you in a good mood as long as you can put it down and use that good mood to do what you want to do next and not fall in the rabbit hole, which is what that one uh, video uh, that sort of showed us. Uh, was about. So a couple of caveats, though, and I talk about this in the textbook, and we're sort of nearing the end of the lecture today. Um, ego depletion is a little controversial as of late. Um, most of us agree and understand that we can get depleted, 
right? And that our cognitive resources are not infinite. Uh, we get fatigued. I mean, after taking, after taking the midterm for this class, did you feel sort of tired? I mean, usually after taking an exam, uh, not just for this class, but any class, you feel a little tired, right? You're exhausted. You've been thinking about something. You've been concentrating. Uh, and you want to blow off steam and relax. So we kind of know that if you're doing something that requires a lot of attention, and a lot of thinking, you're going to be exhausted for a little while afterward. That's not controversial. What's controversial is whether or not the way in which it's been studied uh, is replicable, can be replicated uh, and reproduced by other labs. We've come up against this already, right? The uh, smartphone study was one that didn't seem to replicate. Uh, we talked about the laptop study, which didn't seem to replicate. So sometimes things which are really compelling um, and seem to align with what we already understand, which is a confirmation bias, um, are hard uh, to find evidence that they might not work. Ego depletion being very common and having uh, had hundreds of studies that have sort of shown what, how it works and why it works, uh, also had some difficulties with uh, whether, whether or not it could be replicated. Um, and one of the things that was done was uh, one of these multi-lab multi studies. Uh, so a lab in you know, several different labs, 23 different labs used the same uh, paradigm, uh, the same tasks. Uh, and tried to produce an ego depletion uh, study. Um, and what they found uh, was that uh, in some cases, uh, the ego depletion effect didn't seem to work. Uh, so anything to the right of this red line would be a larger significant ego depletion effect. Uh, anything to the left of the line would be no ego depletion effect. Anything that overlaps the line essentially means no effect. And when you average together all of these different labs and all of these different studies, uh, they found for at least some of the manipulations, it didn't seem to put people into a state of ego depletion. It didn't seem to affect their performance on subsequent tasks. Um, one of the things that um, one of the things uh, to remember, though, is that there are lots of different ways uh, to affect performance with context. In this particular meta-analysis study, uh, the researchers only looked at one particular uh, manipulation. They looked at a manipulation where uh, you were supposed to read through uh, some text and scratch out or cross out particular letters. Um, it might be that that's not as demanding a task uh, as some other kinds of tasks, tasks that might require you to do two or three things uh, or that require a lot of attention or a lot of sustained attention. So subsequent replication efforts have shown that other ego manipulations ego depletion manipulations uh, do seem to be successful. Uh, so it's still up for debate. Uh, some of these uh, tasks seem to be stable. They can be reproduced and they can produce replicable findings. Other tasks and manipulations may not be uh, as replicable. Uh, so there might be more work in this area. As it stands now, it seems to be a stable finding when the tasks are particularly demanding, uh, when the tasks are less difficult, uh, it may not be as stable. Okay, um, I wanna talk last about different kinds of local interference effects. Uh, this should take us right till about 12.10 at the absolute latest. So I wanna talk about two, I wanna talk about interference that comes from a device. Uh, and then interference and changes that come from your surrounding environments. Um, so I use this slide at the beginning of class, the beginning of the term, where we're talking about people's uh, interference from smartphones. Um, I suggest that most people no longer find their smartphone particularly distracting when they need it not to be distracting. Uh, we only find it distracting when we allow it uh, to distract ourselves. So having it on your desk usually isn't a distraction because uh, most people use it. Uh, for things. However, uh, there are lots of times uh, when it does uh, cause a problem. Um, and mostly that's when a notification happens. One of the reasons we probably don't have as much trouble with smartphones is maybe people 10 years ago, which sounds like ancient times, but only a decade ago, uh, your cohort of people who would have been university students eight or 10 years ago might have been more distracted because it was less easy to turn off your notifications. Uh, phones made more noise. 
uh, phones uh, vibrated more. I haven't heard a single noise or a single vibration because most of us are aware of turning off our notification sounds or we allow them for super important things only, like maybe only a certain number uh, might allow your phone uh, to make a notification. So you can customize them. People couldn't customize them in the days of cell phones, right? Your flip phone that would either ring or not, uh, or it would vibrate really loudly or not. So there is an attentional cost because anytime something happens, whether it's a notification that comes up, uh, a text message that comes up, or a, a you know, notification badge that comes up on the bottom of your, uh, you know, one of your devices, the dock or whatever of your computer, uh, that's going to cause you to look at it. And what we want to know is whether or not that interferes with performance. Um, so in this experiment by Stoth, uh, Carrie Stothart uh, and colleagues, uh, they looked at the cost of a single notification. What is the attentional cost of having uh, something happen, causes you to look away for a second, uh, what's going to happen? Uh, so they gave people what's known as a sustained attention to response task. So your job uh, is to press a key whenever a number is flashed as quickly as possible. So you would either have numbers or symbols, and anytime a number is flashed, you have to respond as quickly as possible. And you can get into a pretty good rhythm, and you can be pretty good at it, almost to the point where you could be autom automatic. You could not pay attention, and you could still do it really well. So this task is one level more complicated than that. Press a key when a number is flashed, except if the number was three. So anytime three comes up, you have to withhold your response. And you probably know how well that goes. Uh, anytime you're asked to respond quickly to something uh, and the wrong thing occurs, sometimes you, you commit the response involuntarily and you can't stop it. Uh, you've probably all been in situations where whether it's a video game uh, or any other kind of scenario like that, where you've done something quickly and you didn't mean to. Right, you pushed a button that you didn't mean to push. You pressed the wrong key, uh, even though you knew it was wrong. And you could know that you were making the mistake as you were making it, but you couldn't pull the hand back. Uh, so this is a, a commission error. You make the press on three when you're not supposed to, even though you know you're not supposed to. So in this experiment, uh, people gave were given several different conditions. Um, in the first block, so they went through a whole block of this sustained attention to response uh, task. Everyone was treated the same way. Uh, all of the participants uh, simply did the task. Uh, and we find that there's about a 40% chance of making an error at any given time. So that's kind of the baseline. Uh, your baseline of responding is about 40% mistakes. So that means 60% of the time you correctly withhold the response when you see a three, 40% of the time uh, you accidentally press the button when a three occurs, and you know it, you know you're making a mistake. So the question is, now that we understand your baseline uh, in block one, uh, some participants uh, were continued on into block two in exactly the same way. Uh, they had their phone with them and nothing happened. It was just the same task again. So block one, you make about 40% errors. Block two, you also make about 40% errors. So there's no difference between the two. Uh, these error bars don't overlap in this case um, because they represent standard error. That means that it's just general measurement. There's no difference between the two. People didn't get worse, uh, so there's no significant difference. Some participants, uh, unbeknownst to them, when they had signed up for the study, they gave their uh, phone number to the researcher, and the researcher was in the other room sending them text messages. <laughs> Uh, so every time a text message occurred, uh, they would get temporarily distracted, and you can see that their performance gets worse. Here they are on the control condition. Here they are getting accidental text messages. I guess I'd be like that, too, if I was going along in this basic attention task. Nothing happened. Uh, two minutes later, I'm going along in the basic attention task, and I start getting persistent text messages. My performance would degrade. Imagine what would happen if you started getting text messages persistent. Uh, text messages, your performance would degrade. Look how much worse it gets when you actually get a call because, I mean, mostly when you get a call on your phone, it's one of two things. Either it's nothing, right? It's just an automated response or it's super important, right? When a phone message comes, when an actual voice call comes to your phone, uh, this, the message is different, right? It's more persistent. It has that ringing pulse to it. Even if it's vibrating, uh, it makes a more persistent, you know, deal with me kind of sound or kind of effect. 
it also usually for most people, I don't know about you, but for me, if the phone is make, if the phone is ringing, that usually means there's like an emergency, right? Somebody couldn't get me by text. And so now they're trying to reach me by phone because there's been an accident uh, or somebody's in the hospital uh, or I've, you know, something bad, has, <laughs> something bad has happened. I just, there's no good scenario in which I get a phone call. Uh, so it's either nothing or something bad has happened. Um, and so performance degrades even more uh, because now you're worried about something and you're just unable to pay attention in this task. So getting a message uh, reduces your attention even at this really local level, it's local interference. Uh, all the while, it's just the researcher uh, calling your phone uh, and not leaving a voicemail, uh, but it degrades your performance uh, measurably. Let's talk about the last one, which is ambient noise. Um, this is something that probably affects a lot of people. Uh, how many of you study or work in scenarios that look kind of like this, uh, which might be a really busy uh, room on the library? What's the first two floors of Weldon? You're allowed to be sort of vocal, right? Or if you're in Mustang Lounge, or if you're in one of those sort of social study areas, or a Starbucks, uh, or a busy cafe. Uh, these might be places where you kind of like to work. How many of you like to work in a busy, active, noisy environment, even if you're by yourself? Uh, you can just kind of sit in the ambient noise kind of helps a little bit. I actually do. I mean, I don't like working in this crowded of a setting. Uh, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration. Um, but I find that I can concentrate relatively well uh, in a scenario where there's ambient noise. I can hear people talking, but they're not being loud. There isn't necessarily music playing. There's just ambient noise. It's nothing in particular. So it's a little bit of ambient sound, a little bit of conversation, but I'm not part of it. Uh, it helps people, some people concentrate. Other people like this setting uh, where it's super quiet. How many of you like to study in super quiet uh, settings? Everyone has a personal preference. Uh, some of us like uh, silence. Other people don't like silence. Some people like working uh, alone. Some people like working in groups. Some people like working alone in an area surrounded by people. Uh, and that's sometimes this ambient noise effect. Um, several studies have found though that being in a, an environment with a certain mid-level ambient noise uh, can help enhance creativity and cognitive flexibility. It's not a very strong relationship, but the relationship seems to be there. Um, and it suggests that this kind of what they call stochastic interference. So it isn't something that is distracting. It's just enough that you have to use a little bit more uh, effort to understand what you're doing. Maybe you need to uh, construe a task in a slightly different way. You have to use a different level of abstraction or attention on what it is you're doing because you're doing it in a slightly noisier environment. Not so noisy that it's a bad distraction, but just noisy enough that it's not being alone with your thoughts. And that middle zone seems to enhance creativity. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about two studies. Uh, in the first experiment in this meta study, um, there's several experiments, but let me just talk about the first one. Uh, they created sort of a food court environment or a cafe environment. Um, we blended a combination of multi-talker noise in a cafeteria, roadside traffic, and distant construction noise to create a soundtrack of constantly varying background noise. In other words, what you might hear if you were in a Mustang lounge or some kind of not too busy environment where there's sounds, there's maybe a little bit of traffic, uh, but nothing stands out. There's no one thing that draws your attention. It's just general background noise. Um, they recorded them in real life environments, superimposed them and so on. So they created a really nice ambient noise uh, setting. And then they set up speakers that were low, moderate or high levels of noise. Uh, so either it was barely perceptible, it was normal level of ambient noise, or it was kind of irritatingly loud. Uh, and then, we, then they asked them to do a creativity task. Uh, the creativity task in the first experiment was what's known as a remote associates task. And I'll talk more about this in uh, the class on problem solving and creativity, but a remote associates task is commonly used to assess uh, a particular kind of creativity called divergent thinking. Um, in this case, you're asked to read um, a series of words and come up with the one word that ties them all together. So for the word shelf, read, and end, the correct response is book. 
because it can be a bookshelf, you read a book, and there can be a bookend. So it can't be the same word is used in exactly the same way for all three. It's usually one word that is common in different ways to the words. And these can vary in difficulty. Uh, so some of them are quite difficult and only make sense after you hear the correct word. Others are really easy, like this one. Um, and they predicted that participants in the moderate noise condition, sort of average level of ambient noise, would perform a little bit better. Um, so they did this on a computer. Uh, they had speakers in the room to create the ambient noise, um, like the kind of noise you would hear while dining at a roadside restaurant. Uh, so they were asked that, they were, I think they were told that they were going to be in a restaurant experiment. Uh, so they had other questionnaires to fill out about restaurant experience and noise and so on. And then they rated their mode as well. Uh, and generally what they found was that in this medium noise condition, people solved more of the creativity problems. There was no difference between low and high in control. So control was nothing. Uh, there was a low noise, there was a high noise, but participants in the medium noise condition performed better. Subsequent experiments showed that this effect was stable uh, and that it seemed to do with the level of construal. Uh, participants in a medium amount of noise used a little bit more cognitive energy to construe the task at a more abstract level, which allowed them access to other items in their working memory and in their lexicon. Um, one of my grad students uh, a number of years ago uh, looked at some additional complexities and aspects of this task. We did not create, um, we did not self-record ambient noise. What we used was, suddenly you're in a restaurant. There's nothing going on. But if you've got this on headphones, you would think you're in a dining hall. And so participants carried out a series of cognitive tasks with this on high, medium, or no noise. It actually kind of, kind of, kind of soothing uh, at, a, at a medium volume. You can sort of have this in the background. There's no conversation. There's no music to distract you either. Uh, it just kind of sounds like you're not sitting alone in your room. This is what late stage capitalism has brought to us. We don't actually sit in cafes. We sit alone and listen to cafe sounds. Or worse, we go to a cafe, put on noise canceling headphones and listen to cafe sounds uh, in the cafe. So here's how it works. Um, Emily, uh, my student at the time, uh, used what's called a compound remote associate tasks uh, it just has easy, midi medium, and hard difficulty items. So it expands the range from eight uh, to 30 different items. Um, we also gave some insight problem tasks, um, an alternative uses task, uh, and then some follow-up questionnaires to ask them about their mood and so on. I wanna focus on a few of these. Um, these are sort of the difficulty levels. Basket, eight, and snow. Uh, the answer might be ball because it's a snowball, an eight ball, a and a basketball, hard difficulty, back step and screen, coming up with door takes more effort. Um, coming up with crab when you see grass, king and meat takes more effort uh, because it's less clearly related. Uh, does that seem, does that make sense? Uh, medium level difficulty, dust, cereal and fish, uh, a fishbowl makes sense. So these have been normed and studied uh, over several different experiments to show that people have difficulty uh, with these uh, complex items. Uh, insight problems. Uh, participants were given a problem which is obvious when you see the answer, but often requires people to think through a lot of this. And this has also been used as a measure of creativity. A town in Northern Ontario, 5% of the people living in a town have an unlisted phone number. If you selected 100 names at random from the town's phone directory. On average, how many of these people selected would have an unlisted number? Uh, the answer that most people would first come up with uh, is five, because you're told it's 5%, until you realize that if they had an unlisted number, you wouldn't be able to select their number from the phone uh, directory. So the solution would be zero. So this is an insight problem, meaning that the obvious answer is wrong, uh, the correct answer is one that requires you to pay attention to something other than the first information uh, that's present. 
We'll talk more about insight problem solving when we do our problem solving lecture. Uh, and we found a similar effect, not as strong, uh, but in the medium noise condition, uh, we found that performance uh, on the difficult items, the difficult remote associate items, uh, was enhanced relative to control and high. Smaller effect, and it wasn't observed for the easy items, it was only observed for the harder items. Okay, so just some quick conclusions. Um, I think it's pretty clear from what we've talked about, and one of the things I want you to take home, so the take home message is that these situations that sometimes we can control, but sometimes we can't control, uh, affect how you think. Uh, so whether it's the mood that you're in, the situation that you find yourself in, your particular motivational characteristics, uh, the way in which you've learned to develop self-control and how long you're trying to exert self-control can all affect the things that you think about. And what usually happens uh, is that system one picks up the slack if system two is compromised. If system two is compromised because you're cognitively tired or depleted or in a bad mood um, or whatever, uh, system two is there or system one is there to always provide the answer, usually the right answer, but sometimes it's an error because it might be a cognitive bias. It might produce the answer that's incorrect that comes to mind. Uh, it might produce the answer that someone else wants you to produce because they present the information in a way that points you in one direction or the other, whether it's anchoring uh, or framing. Those anchoring and framing effects that we started off talking about at the beginning, those can be manipulated by other people to take advantage of the time when you're fatigued, take advantage of the time when you're cognitively tired or in a bad mood, and you make a decision based on what comes first. So, I would suggest just learning stuff about yourself, whether you do well under pressure, whether you tend to adopt a gain focus or a promotion focus, uh, and seek out the kinds of conditions, whether it's how to study, where to study, when to study, what to avoid, what not to avoid. Uh, and those are the things that are probably likely gonna help uh, make the right kinds of decisions. Okay, I think that's my final slide. It is my final slide. So uh, the quiz will be available at 12.30. Uh, it's available until 11.30 tonight. Uh, takes 15 minutes, uh, unless you uh, have an extension uh, due to an accommodation, in which case that would be the same accommodations you've had all along. Uh, it's multiple choice, random response answers, like they're in random order. Uh, so you won't always have the same questions as everyone else. Um, but yeah, I think it should be pretty straightforward. Same as the first two quizzes. Uh, answers, in the... the um, uh, answers should be available, not the answers, but the scores should be available uh, tomorrow morning. Okay, have a good week. Uh, enjoy the rest of the weekend. If you do have fun this weekend, uh, have fun <laughs> uh, this weekend. And I'll see you back here next week.